moving through the forest and you're, if you're speaking to each other, you don't want to be making a lot of noise, which some people, that seems to be what they like to do, but <laughs> our people like to walk very quietly and keep their language where it would flow right in with the breeze in the, in the leaves, the rustle of a small animal perhaps, but uh, not making a disturbance because obviously that is also a land where other beings live and we try not to be real intrusive. So in our language, Abenaki is closer to the way we would have pronounced it in the old way, just because it doesn't have as strong a syllable as the European languages have. And then you have me uh, growing up uh, Abenaki. And so uh, there's the definite French influence for my family. Um, and so, and again, it was more of, oh, you're more from the southern area, or you're more eastern. It really was an accent of more of being able to tell more of where folks were coming from. And, sorry, Carolyn, Carolyn. No, but it's true. Uh, growing up, it was a Beneghi. Uh, what are the traditional roles, so to speak, of women versus men in the Abenaki culture? <laughs> They're only deferring to me because I'm older. <laughs> it's a sign of respect, but it's also a, a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> there were gender roles, for sure, and um, women are the life bringers. It was, it was not at all the kind of attitude toward women that came across the great water with the settlers. Um, women certainly were not chattel property, which they were with the settlers. So there was a huge cultural contrast right off. But the women, obviously, are the life bringers, the ones that bring new life into the world and among the people. The women are seen as an extension of Mother Earth, who also is a life bringer. Uh, and the women are the nurturers and to a great extent, the teachers. So it's a very honored role. They were certainly totally equal with the men. It was pretty much an egalitarian culture. Women could do virtually anything as, as girls and young women, um, but they were taught the kinds of skills that a woman in a community as a homekeeper and a, and a caretaker of children would need to know. In other words, how to make clothing, how to preserve food, cooking, things like that. But also, they could go out on the trails. There were women who were traders. There were women who took the warrior trail until they started childbearing. At that point in time, because their role was so terribly important for the future of the people, because the children were the future of the culture of the people, then they tended to stay much closer to camp and to the group and take care of the children. So you will hear sometimes there's not much in recorded history, because that wasn't recorded by us, it was recorded by other people who only saw things through their cultural lens and misunderstood some things. But you will occasionally hear of women chiefs. There were women who were medicine persons as well as men. There were women who went out on raids until they reached the point where they started childbearing. So it had everything to do with the role of nurturer, and, and the keeper of the future of the people with the life bringing. I go with that. <laughs> uh, Carol has so much historical knowledge and, and for me to, to look at an elder um, as, as Carol is, that was another role that was very, very important to the people. 
that, that an elder was considered to be so because they knew. And the people who came to them for advice and knowledge um, knew that what they were being taught was real. Um, it, it, it's a little bit sad nowadays that women and the elders don't have the kind of respect that the culture traditionally had. Um, but I think that maybe we can bring that back as people become aware, more aware of the importance and the value that women have as culture bearers and as teachers. Um, they're nurturers. They're all that Carol mentioned. So for me, it, it's very important to go back to the old ways, to learn what the old ways were. And the best resource for that are the elders and the women, the culture bearers. And uh, again, growing up, the women were the storytellers, again, with that culture being culture bearers, um, with the storytelling and passing that along to the community, to the children, um, many, many times literally sitting at the knee of my mother and um, other women elders in the community and hearing the stories passed on. And some of the kids would be like, oh, you told that story already, and they'd want to go run off and play. And yet they still told it again, and they told it again, and they told it again, so that we hopefully would remember and be able to carry that forward. And um, women during circle, ta circle talking, circle healing circles uh, is, would sit in the East uh, in honor of being the ones who bring the life into the world. It wasn't a relegation. It was an acknowledgment of that role and women wearing skirts, and especially if you were still having periods, let's be frank about it, um, that was expected. And it was not the way European culture came into this country to and treated women. It was a recognition of honor of our role and what and women being exactly that. Um, so I agree with what Carol has said and those adi that additional information for you. We're fighting with the men mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Too many of our men are very, as we call it, they're very colonized. They have adopted an awful lot without, I think, real awareness that they've adopted a lot of the value system of the dominant society. And the women who are traditionalists have pulled back into the shadows literally for decades, for the past hundred years or more. And they're beginning to do that again because the men are, especially now that it's safe to be Native American, the men are are quite taken, but and a few women, but mostly it's the men, with how can I make money off this culture? Because there's a big interest in it. And it's something that's deeply troubling to some of us women, at least, um, because it's exploiting the culture for money, and that's not an old Abenaki value. We didn't commercialize our culture and our teachings. And some of our teachings are really sacred. We don't run around doing a pipe ceremony every time there's a few people gathered as a way of kind of being on display. It's, that's an abuse of a sacred ceremony yeah. with, without the participants really having had proper teachings or understanding. So how do we bring that back? The women are working together more and more and, and discussing these things and teaching each other because we're having to relearn. We lost a lot. We spent a lot of time hiding in plain sight. If you met me on the street, you wouldn't necessarily know that I'm Native American. Um, and we had to do that because there was a lot of discrimination 
but they're also in the early part of the 20th century, there was a very active effort to get rid of us. I mean, they, first there were the wars. Most of the wars were really between French and British, and then British and colonists. Um, they weren't really our wars, but our, our warriors got right into it as, as auxiliaries because they could be warriors, but also they thought if they could help one side or another win, maybe it could help all our people because those who were more abusive could maybe be conquered and got rid of. Uh, it didn't really work, but it was, it was tried. So now it's safe to be Abenaki. The state is not trying to sterilize our people or take most of the time, not trying to take the children away, put them in foster homes, which is what happened in Vermont. But now that it's safe, there are too many of people who are thinking, OK, now there's a lot of people interested. I can do presentations and make a lot of money. And so the women are having to struggle with this because we keep trying to talk with the men. That, Wait a minute. That's not helping our people. We do these presentations because we want to share understandings with well-intentioned people who are interested and respectful and want to learn. And we have no problem with that. We're willing to share. We're very willing to dialogue. We just ask that it be treated with respect. And, and we are trying to teach our own women, and then by extension, the children and the, the men and the families to bring back those teachings, which much of which got lost. Andrea, did you have a comment? Um, you also, we, you, there's also the environment of power. And so right or wrong, good or bad, if there's a piece of steak and there's four of you, you're going to fight over who gets the, big, the piece of steak and who gets the biggest piece. And instead of acknowledging that we need to, I feel that we are moving into the realm of being the elder women in the community as part of answering your question. And so our, many of our female elders have passed on. So we don't have them for ourselves anymore. We've lost that. Um, and if within that wanting to grab power, hold power, um, if the male leaders of our communities would hold the respect for the female elders, it is our job to not only say to them, wait, you're supposed to be treading lightly here and you need to be humble. You don't have this, the, again, the European mindset of this power because you deserve it. You have this power because, and it is a responsibility, it is a gift, and you need to be responsible with that. One needs to. So that's another thing that in Abeniki, the you, the way it is used plurally. So um, that, just to back up that statement for you, um, so really, as Carol said, as we becoming the elder women of the community, we need to find a way to remind the male leaders of our community that this is our job and this is our role and this is our responsibility. I don't know the best answer for you. We don't have one. I would like to, that's my utopian thinking. And we also have a community of a very dear coworker of mine said, hurt people hurt people. And we ourselves need to engage in our own communal healing and then have a chance to bring that to the, not only our, our own children within the Abenaki community. And hopefully that model is of value to bring to others in the wider community. That's my pie in the sky thinking on that. You can yeah. tell I've thought a lot about it. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, it's important to note 
Uh, well, Carol, did you, you wanted to go ahead? Yeah, I, I think one thing that we can all do um, to bring this change about is to listen more to the women. But the women, on the other hand, um, have to grow a voice. And a lot of us have been in the background for so long that we either don't dare speak out or when we do, we feel so uncomfortable that we don't say what we really feel. Um, it's hard to grow a voice. I probably was the least vocal person you've ever met until having the experience on, on the Native American Commission that you know, you have to go out, you have to be strong, you have to advocate for your people. Um, and to do that, you can't hide in the shadows, you have to come forth. And as uncomfortable as it is, that's really how change takes place. So I think the media takes the easy way out, that they often only communicate with those who are quite visible and don't look beyond that and look to a lower level of, you know, we're always in the background, we're always there, we're always teaching, and we do have a voice. We're just not quite as vocal. So I think that that's one of the big changes. And I see a little bit, as Carol said, women are teaching each other, and they're giving each other that confidence to go out and speak and take that chance that people may not listen, but on the other hand, even if you reach one person, that much of the world has changed. Thank you, Carol. Oh. Well, I'm sad and happy at the same time that I only have one meeting left. Um, I've been on the commission for six years now, and four of those have, have been as chair. Um, I have to say that without my vice chair, Carol, I never could have accomplished what we have with the commission. Um, we talked through a lot of stuff, <laughs> but um, this year, for example, we were working on the school mascot band um, that we did not feel that ethnic school mascots were appropriate and were very harmful. That legislation was passed. Um, the land tax exempt bill for Abenaki owned land um, that passed. We over the years have gotten Indigenous Peoples Day as it, it's changed um, from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. We've had proclamations for Abenaki Heritage Week. Um, Signage for the state parks in Apanaki, those were added. And as the signs are changed, the Apanaki um, language will be added. Oh gosh, there's more. <laughs> there's more, but. Well, they, they now, because the legislature began learning, because of Carol's advocacy with the Friends of the State House, uh, diversity committee and she worked for almost a year and a half to get the the Abenaki um, display in the State House. Uh, I had her back but she was the one advocating and at one point she began explaining to them the story of her family during the eugenics and I was thinking oh gosh we don't talk about that stuff. And I was ducking my head, and she kept right on, of course. And then I looked around, and everybody at the table, and they were, there was 12 to 15 people at the table, they were all leaning over, looking intently, listening totally. There was dead silence in the room except Carol telling this story, which put a face and some flesh on something that had happened early in the 20th century that most of them had no idea about because it's not taught in the public schools. Part of our effort to write and do presentations now is because this kind of knowledge needs to get out and now you all are gonna you know, carry a little bit more knowledge and understanding with you, hopefully. And we're trying to get material that can go to the schools 
like the coloring the, the, the book with language uh, vocabulary that came out of the Missiskoi tribe and the booklet I wrote summarizing from an indigenous point of view about the history. But as Carol sat there telling this, the legislator, there was only one legislator in the room, but the friends of the state house were stunned. This was totally new information to them. Now they weren't, most of them weren't as old as I am, but still, they'd come up in the public schools mid 20th century, uh, two thirds of the way through 20th century, and this had never been taught. That leaked on out and got into the legislature, and the legislature this past year did, and you'll hear from the legislator who headed that effort up, he really did his homework. Legislator, um, Representative Tom Stevens, he did his homework, he re really had studied it, and he led the legislative effort for them to issue a formal apology by joint session of, of both the representatives and the Senate. Picking up from that, they wanted to set up a truth and reconciliation process. You heard about the one probably that was done in South Africa with Reverend De Desmond Tutu and, and people there because of apartheid. There was one done up in Maine, which was a real dud. It didn't work well. It was top down and it just didn't work well. They want to do one here in Vermont. And we've tried to work for the last year and a half, trying to, <laughs> being the women, Abenaki women, trying to push about how that process might best be meeting the needs of the Abenaki people. Unfortunately, the dominant society's values and they control the legislative process and they know what's best for us, I guess. And there are other groups that have also been struggling with the same issue now. Once this all kind of broke open, that we had been, our people had been sterilized or, or discriminated against. Certainly black people had, certainly people with disabilities have experienced that and so on. There's minority groups in Vermont. They're struggling with how to do this and we have tried very hard to have input into that. But that's us trying to have input into the dominant society with their own assumptions and understandings and their own structure of how things happen in this state. We don't control that structure. And having input into it is, is well, I could use a crude phrase, I won't, but it, it's difficult. Um, so that's part of what we've really been working in. It's part of the reason I'm, I'm very glad I've got one more meeting because it's frustrating. But uh, there are good people who are trying to address this. It's just that they can't think outside of what they've spent 50 years thinking and perceiving and how they understand things and how the process works, how the systems work. And for them to somehow step out of that is, is extremely difficult for them. I feel also that um, part of the frustration this year, we came, the commission came up with a list of seven things on our wish list, and we got one. So that's part of the frustration too, is that the dominant society doesn't realize oh my gosh, when they did the land tax exemption, I listened to some of the testimony that the committee was having for funding that, and one lady was like, oh my gosh, it's gonna cost like, it's gonna cost the state $9,000 if we, you know. And they're looking at what, a budget of 800 million or something, you know, and then they, they finally pass it, but they put all of these guardrails on it, like, well, the assumption is that the Abenaki aren't going to get any more land, um, that, it, that, I don't know, it was just incredible to know that tax exemptions on churches, schools, uh, animal shelters, cemeteries, VFWs, every alphabet you can think of, and yet the Abenaki were held to this, oh my gosh, you can't, 
you can't ever have any more land. And yet if a church or VFW want to build another facility, no holes barred. And then you look at the bottom line of $9,000 in, in such a large budget, and they were arguing over that. It really, it's to me kind of a blatant way of showing, of illustrating where the Abenaki stand in the state. You know, it's if you can give a pet shelter more I don't know, more credibility or whatever than, than a group of marginalized people, what does this say? You know, so I think that's part of the advocacy that the commission needs to continue pushing, that we are a people who have been so marginalized over centuries now, that we need to start having more of a voice and more of a recognition that we exist. That's why that display in the state house is so darn important because people who visit from out of state, I think all the visitors, there's like 150,000 a year who pass through. And they see that display and they go, oh wow, we thought Vermont didn't have any Indians. I mean, that's what we were taught, right? Um, to change that narrative, to make people aware that we are here, we've always been here is so important because that's the first step is recognizing and acknowledging that we're here. Um, when we were doing the workshop with um, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, group, we decided that the reconciliation didn't really apply to Apenaki because we'd never been consiled with the dominant society. That it was more appropriate that it be truth and accountability to make the people who did this to us accountable for their actions. So I'll leave on that note, but there's just so much more to do, so much more. Andrew. So I'm going to give them my wish list when I leave. <laughs> and to echo what Carol and Carol have said and what you just said is still a very patriarchal attitude of pat you on the head, very condescending. We still know best uh, what you need. And to say no more land um, is an insult. And we, when I was on the commission, we had a lot of, we had a number of folks come wanting to repatriate land. And where does that stand now? People can't do that. There's no avenue in which to do that. Uh, with showing that respect back to the Abeniki here. And, um, I am very angry and frustrated, frankly, about this process and that it was totally taken away from the folks who actually need the accountability, the reconciliation, and it's, frankly, it probably will be like Maine and it will fail because they have taken it as a top-down patriarchal, they know better than we do, and um, I will leave it at that because I am actually not happy about, about it at all. As, uh, as comprehensive as the official apology was, um, and you can read it if you like, it's a, we have a copy on display in the lobby. Uh, and what took place, the official reading of it took place last fall, I believe, or late last year? I think it was in July last year. Yeah, and um, yeah, and uh, um, the <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was really struck by the fact that at that reading, um, there were many Abnaki there, of course. N the reading did not involve inviting commentary from any of those Abnaki people. It was simply a, a straight reading of the apology from the podium by state officials, and uh, there was no dialogue at all. That, that, was what, that was one thing that was strange to me. Um, the other thing I find strange is that you said one out of seven, right? Um, the uh, Abenaki Heritage Week in the, is, has been de designated first week in May again this year, but that is not yet something that is automatically recognized every year. It's got, they're asking them to petition for it every year, to ask for it every year. So. Again, you know, uh, what? 
uh, apology's nice, but actions are better, right? Well, and I think with the with the proclamation, I I took it upon myself to request it. You have to go through a, a process online, and I put it in, I think, two months before we were asking for it, and the governor signed it the Friday before May 1st, so we had two days, which didn't really, you know, without the Lost Nation Theater, um, there were a few other events that went on. Um, I think there were tribal, tribally affiliated events, but, you know, it doesn't give us a lot of time to plan, and why it took that long for him to say, it, it was a simple proclamation, you know. Um, yeah, the first week in May is Abenaki Heritage Week. Gosh, some folks get a whole month, you know. <laughs> so it, it's another thing we'll that that I'm hoping that um, the commission will continue. I plan to be a thorn in their side and attend the meetings. So whether they let me speak or not, <laughs> I'll probably make noise anyway. But I I think that the more people who advocate for change the more change will happen, and maybe next year we'll get two out of seven. Uh, we don't really have partners with the commission. We're kind of out on our own. If you read the statute and what we're responsible for, it's pretty comprehensive. Everything from health care to um, education, housing, um, but we really don't, and we've, we've had Tom's representative, Tom Stevens, help us with some of this legislation, but we really don't have an outside group that's like out there, you know, holding signs, we need this, we need that. Um, I'd love to have a partnership. But let me explain what the commission structure is. It's the umbrella group for all indigenous people in Vermont because there's not just Abenaki, there are Blackfoot, Lakota, Anishinaabe. In fact, we had a Lakota and Anishinaabe on our, on our commission. Um, so the perfect structure would be that there would be a representative from each of the four recognized tribes who, ha who are on the commission so that they could bring to us what their tribal um, interests were or what they would like us to work on. This year we had three of the four. One of the tribes didn't have a representative. That may change this coming up here. But what we were trying to do was work with the chiefs and we had our meeting last week. We actually had invited the chiefs specifically to come and be at our meeting so that they could speak directly with us and talk about some of the events that took place in April. We have not always had a good working relationship with them um, and I'm hoping that this will open up the conversation so that they'll, fee they'll feel more um, comfortable in coming to us directly. So the representatives are great, but sometimes that's what you need is the direct contact. Um, the tribal structure. Uh, I was taught, or I believe the narrative that the chiefs were the end all, do all. They told you what to do and you did it. That, that's the European concept. A chief is chosen for the leadership skills they have. And as Andrea had mentioned at one point, they're supposed to be humble um, and work for the people, for the good of the people. But they have to be, they're the voice of the people and the people who have supported them, not the other way around. You know, I, I guess I'm not explaining that well, but they're really no different than the rest of us. That when you have a circle, there's no head that stands above anyone else's. And so the chief, when he's in that circle, doesn't stand above anyone else. He may be the voice, but he has no more power than anyone else. So again, I think that misconception, that, that narrative that's gone out there 
um, really has adversely affected the way that people deal with the Abenaki community. Um, there was at one point one person who always said he was the one, he was the only, that's all anybody ever had to speak with, and that's not true. Everybody has an equal voice. So I'll leave it at that. In our culture, in the old way, in, our, in the Abenaki culture, we did not have a pyramid of authority. Now this is very different than what came across the water with the colonists because they had kings and queens, mostly kings, but also queens, and then they had the nobles and, and so on. They had these layers of authority up to the final authority of the, the monarch. The Abenaki culture functioned in circles. There were many small bands that were primarily extended family groupings, anywhere from eight or 10 people to maybe 30 to 40 people within a given territory. Now there are only four state-recognized tribes. There's at least a couple other groups that did not try for state recognition, but that gather and operate, have some, have some uh, culturally related activities and all. So that's the way the structure is now, and each tribe runs its own affairs. There is no centralized government. There is no pyramid of authority. Each group is, is independent. So this makes it very hard for um, people who want to approach some kind of centralized process and delineate information or 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 gathering, getting, you know, when they do their truth and reconciliation process, they're going to want people to come tell their stories, and a lot of our people will not do it. Some will. Some who don't mind coming and sitting in front of a group of people and speaking. But many, many of our people just don't relate to that. They don't do it that way. And, and coming to tell their story for what? To a group of people who are sitting on land we never ceded, who up until it just passed the legislature, we, we've all paid taxes, and any of us that live in houses or own any land will still pay property taxes. The only part that's exempt is tribally owned land, which is very, very little. And, and there, the governor put in his, it's not the force of law, but he put in his comment that he wanted to make sure that, that this should, this should um, ensure that the tribes not gain any other property. Well, our people operated on large parcels of land where they had forests and meadows and streams, and, and they developed the skills of living off the land and living in harmony with other life forms that was part of our value system and our way of life. Now, expecting people to somehow deal with the political establishment or a multi-layered bureaucratic system in somehow coming to testify and tell stories and it's so contrary to our culture that it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what happens but there are a lot of our people that are to totally unwilling to do that and so the ones who do do it are the ones who are much more in tune with the dominant culture and not so much enmeshed with roots in the old culture for which that's, that just feels, feels strange. So that we got a real values conflict, a real cultural dissonance that's still very evident. Um, we try to walk with a foot in both worlds. It's not very comfortable. Um, sometimes we do better at it, sometimes not. But that's, that's where the Abenaki, the larger community, is at this point in time. Someone had a question. Um, and to be doing that testifying, to, to bring that hurt to this group of strangers, when, I'm ta when I had mentioned earlier, hurt people hurt people, we have, I'm not tribally affiliated so you have folks who are tribally affiliated and folks like me who are not. 
and um, I will. S that's the way I like it. Um, and um, so, what will happen there? Will it be like Odinac coming down here? Uh, will it be, oh, you're not tribally affiliated, so we can't listen to you? Will that create further division? Um, I, for one, wouldn't go and testify and open up my own hurts, because what will they do with those? Rehash everything? Will there be any avenue for healing? No. And when you're having four separate tribally, um, state-recognized tribes, will they be able to come together uh, and do a healing circle, all of us together, I don't see that happening. I would love to see it happen. And that would be a way of taking care of, okay, yes, you're going to go and testify to this legislature. What are they going to do with it? And then where do you go with that, with your reopening those wounds for healing yourself and healing the community? We need to have that avenue to hear, heal ourselves, heal each other, and all, all the bands need to come. To, I know we say tribes, it's bands. We need to come together, and we need to engage in those healing circles together. And those egos and agendas and power struggles need to be left at the door when you enter that circle, because that's what you do when you smudge. You release the negative energies, you keep that smudge bowl going in order to dispel the negative energy that it cannot enter, and you enter an agreement together in that circle for that healing process. That's what needs to be happening. I do feel strongly about this. <laughs> Sure, the earlier, I mean, there's always an economic system in the general sense of the word. There's an exchange of goods and services in one way or another. Um, trade was very active on this whole continent well before anybody came from Western Europe. Um, the, the mindset about it, however, it had, there was a different perspective that underlay um, we had traders, women sometimes were traders, men certainly were, could be traders, and often too the traders were storytellers because they were going from maybe from Abenaki country up through Penobscot country to Mekamah country or over to Huron, back around to Abenaki, or maybe traveling further west or further south, interacting with other groups as they traded because something made here uh, may not be common 500 miles away, and as they traded, they could trade that because it was seen as valuable, different, and they could obtain something that wasn't common here, and so on. So it was, it was that was one means of intertribal communication, and things were learned from other peoples, and some of our things were shared with other peoples, there was strong interaction. There were trade trails all over this continent. And people traveled incredible distances and didn't think much of it. I mean, it was just, I mean, we all walked. We walked and we paddled our canoes and so on, but long distance travel was, was common. And, and so um, that was one way of interaction. The, the imposition of a common medium of exchange, which is what money is, we can all agree that money can be used for, for trading for anything, rather than me having to have something that you don't want, I've got to find somebody who wants it to get something from them that you might want, it starts getting complicated. So money seemed a lot more convenient in that sense, it seemed a good system, but the mindset was that the value was became detached from any effort that went into it or any resources or any connection with a belief system or, or a lifestyle. It, it was only money in terms of its commercial value, and that's what the capitalism is. So. It became more impersonal, and I do think it's very destructive because my teaching you, a value would be put on that. Should I charge? 
in our way, you couldn't charge for teachings, but somebody would be expected to bring you tobacco and maybe a fine present because they valued your teachings and they were asking for an exchange. The concept of reciprocity was totally embedded in this. So it wasn't like, you know, what do you charge? 150 bucks, 300 bucks, $25, what do you charge? It wasn't on a monetary value. It was that they recognized knowledge and skills that they were seeking, and they honored it by what they brought to the exchange. So it was an exchange of energy rather than a commercial um, concept at all. First of all, I'd like to add a little bit about the uh, commercialism and, and all with the money. You've all heard of wampum. That means money, right? In, in traditionally, that was a skill. It took great skill. It took so much energy and skill and time to make a bead of wampum, that that's what was valued. So for somebody to make a wampum belt to give somebody as a gift, that was highly, highly valued. And Europeans come over and they see this and they say, well, Native people really value this, so it must be worth lots of money. You know, so that, that again got kind of bastardized. You know, it was, it was totally taken in a different way. If I make something that I feel it, it, it's taken me a very long time to do and it comes out well and somebody says to me, Oh, I want to buy that. How much do you want? And I'm like, well, if I really liked you, I'd give it to you. But, you know, I, I, I gift things. I don't usually sell them. So that, that whole concept that Carol was talking about of, of valuing and giving uh, something in return that is valuable, it's not money. It's, it, it, it really is the root of all evil, you know, that, that holds true. So I'm sorry I got off on that. But um, for healing, I think it's going to take a change in leadership um, that often people in leadership roles right now don't realize how hurt the Apanaki community is and how they need to come together to heal. Um, I guess I better leave it at that. Carol, would you? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of cynical right now, I guess. Um, I think, I, th I totally agree that it, it, it's going to take a change of leadership. I think those with deeper roots in the in the Abenaki culture, they're pulling back. And I know I'm pulling back because years ago, I, I taught a group over a period of some years. And then one by one, they would peel off. And um, they weren't all indigenous. Some of them were white and wanted to play Indian, and they would do things inappropriately. It, the value system is just different enough that it didn't translate in an appropriate way. So I stopped doing that. And then years ago, when I first was getting on the commission, I've been on seven years now and uh, by a fluke, actually. but. I wanted to start teaching youth. I did teach a small group of adults that I felt then we would have a core of teachers who could then help. And I wanted to go on and start teaching our youth. We're losing a lot of our kids, as all of you are. These kids are getting into substance abuse. They are so busy with their gizmos. The social relationships are suffering. and. It, it affects them neurologically, I, I'm convinced, and so on. But I just wanted to be able to get them out in the, in the fields and the woods and teach them 
you know, when you're sitting there by the fire, what is the fire teaching you? And help them to understand that the process of using a fire bowl to make a fire, there's a whole sex education class in that, but there's also a whole teaching of the concept of fire is a living thing, the fire of life. When you make living fire a living life, what kind of responsibility do you have? It needs appropriate boundaries. It needs to be nurtured to keep going and so on. There's all these kind of teachings that you can teach youth and they're wide open for it. When they're weaving a basket, are you talking about, look at when you've got a stronger reed and a thinner reed, you put them together. And the strong one helps the thin one, but the thin one might be a little more flexible so it can help the strong one to weave into the others and so on. And you start teaching social skills with something they've got a physical manifestation of. And they, they do take it in because they're totally focused. Not like us that are scattered to the winds now, but you know, so teaching those kinds of things with youth seemed to me as a way of bringing back the living culture and the value system and beginning to get a core of people who then go back to their extended families and their communities and grad even though you've got to walk with a foot in both worlds, they could also share those insights and it could give them a core of values that could carry them through life in a good way. I was ready to do this. We were scrambling to try and get together some money to do it because it costs money to feed kids and have teachers and rent a place for them to stay and, and all of that. And I contacted the chiefs of the tribes to say, you know, what, what youth might you have that would come to a camp? We'd like to teach some woods lore skills and some understanding of the plant people and uh, some, of the, some of the skills, some of the spiritual practices, tracking, whatever. Uh, what, what youth can you, do you have some youth that you could talk up about coming? Not one of them responded to me. This was a chance for their own young people. And what the commission members came back to say is, we don't have kids of that age in our tribes. This was horrifying to me. There are some little kids that come to some of the tribal gatherings. I know with Lucy, she's taught some of them some drumming and singing and crafts. And uh, certainly Brenda Gagne is, is doing a whale of a job with her after school program and her circle of courage teaching those kids. But as they get into young adolescence, we start losing them. And I did not get the cooperation. Now we've got some different chiefs now. So again, maybe that's something to try. I'm a long way along on the path and I'm hoping some younger people that are willing to do that kind of thing will come along. But this is the problem. How are we gonna recover our old culture when we've got people who are so into their laptops and their, uh, their either their drugs or they got to earn money and, and money speaks to these kids because how else do they get their gizmos? And, and their fancy jeans with the holes in them. Uh, you know, so the values is killing our culture. That's what I see. And I am pessimistic because I have, now I'm willing to try to write some material and I can put that out. And there are people who are not indigenous who are very interested in, and many of them deeply respectful in learning this. Well, you know, Going back to the commercialism, there's an old prophecy, and we're at a fork in the road. And I think that's not our, just our culture that it's killing. This world is in trouble. It's in deep trouble because the values that everybody is so frantically chasing and the corporations and the ones with power are so frantically hanging on to are the very values that are killing the planet, Mother Earth, the other life forms, we're losing them, we're having mass die-offs, 
And now, of course, we're having a mass die-off of the two-leggeds, right? Because that's part of what COVID is. There's too many people. We controlled our populations so that we wouldn't over-harvest, over you know, so that we had to stay within the carrying capacity of the land. That, that's just respect for other life forms that nurture us. And of course, eventually we nourish, nourish the worms and the bugs and all, and it's all just part of the system. That, that works. But the, the way the world is going is so destructive, people are now saying, well, we need sustainability. What we are doing now is not sustainability. It's deadly. We have to change to a different value system. The old prophecies say that. We're at a fork in the road. We're either going to circle back, and they prophesied this, that two people would become one, and then we would have a fork in the road. And this is a, an Algonquian prophecy, a, a Wabanaki prophecy. And people would take, make one choice. They would circle back to the original instructions. That's the value system I've been talking to you about. Or if they made the other choice, it was the path of self-destruction. And that's these other things. And I think we're there now. So I would encourage you to think about the kind of values that reduces the tremendous impact on the other life forms because they can live well without us, but we can't survive without them. And we need to honor them and start trying to be more gentle and consume less. You know, they tell you to shop till you drop. That's contrary to salvation for the planet and the life forms. I, because so many of the elders had passed by the time I was having my children, I, um, I remembered some things from growing up, and then others I did um, learn from Mi'kmaq elders uh, in my 20s for uh, the talking circles, the healing circles, with regaining that knowledge at that time um, and practicing those traditions. And in my own family, on my father's side, with my grandmother being called a, a derogatory French term of Canuck for half-breed, and myself being picked on because my father was so dark that my grandmother slept with a black man um, and that my parents looked so much alike, they were really brother and sister. In my own lifetime, um, I actually had jaw surgery because I had a big space between my teeth and my jaw was also crooked, but um, so that I would not, and when I smile, I show a lot of gums and I got picked on through most of my childhood. So I actually had jaw surgery to change all of that. Um, and now I wish I actually hadn't. I miss my space. But that said, um, my father had it, you know, it's, um, and it was also part of an identity, as simple as that. Um, so just to answer some of those within my own family, where some of those experiences, and just, uh, you know, you're a little kid. You don't really pay attention. You just know that you're gathering with folks, and there's drumming, and there's dancing, and there's singing, and there's food, and there's food. <laughs> uh, and you're playing with other little kids. Um, sorry. Uh, and uh, now that I'm older, and I realize what, those, what that meant. Um, so to, I think that was to one of the questions. Thing that Carol was talking about of there's so many connections to so many parts of our world. The two-legged, the four-legged, the flyers, the swimmers, the creepy crawlers, the standing stills, the rooted ones, they're all people too. They're just not in human form. So if we gave the respect that we give, or I hope we give other people to these as well, it's starting to heal the earth when you give that respect because you understand that without them you can't exist. And as Carol said, if we all disappeared today, they'd get along probably much better than they do now because they wouldn't have to contend with the way that we use them and destroy them. So we're all in it together. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been really, really special afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for coming.